Welcome back to another episode of the Sky Society podcast. Today, I am very excited to be chatting with Tulani Andre. She is the Vice President of Social Media at National Geographic, the largest brand in the world on social media, where she drives all social and digital engagement for National Geographic's suite of shows, documentary, print, and digital storytelling. Previously, Tulani was at Prime Video, where she was the global lead of social and editorial. And prior to Prime Video, she was the vice president of social media at Fox Corporation and has a myriad of roles before that that we're going to kind of touch on as well. So welcome, Tulani. Very excited to have you. Thanks. Glad to be here. All right. So I know I gave you a little intro about the career side and your career journey, but before we jump in, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I am Tulani Andre, Vice President of Social at National Geographic. Um, I've been at Nat Geo for about five or six months now, um, leading a team of about 13 and hopefully growing soon um, that works on social across everything happening at Nat Geo. So they work on titles, they work on editorial, they're working with, you know, the O&O digital site, all of that. And so it's a really great group to be able to lead and manage and also work with and see their creativity and their passion uh, for all things Nat Geo, which is obviously such a historic brand and comes along with so much more. Yes, it's I'm super excited to kind of dive into what you do at that role because it honestly sounds like just such an incredible dream job that I think a lot of us in this room would love to have someday. Um, but as always, I love going back to the beginning and I want to start kind of, obviously you didn't just wake up one day as, you know, in charge of Nat, Nat, Nat Geo social media. There was a lot that went into it before you started. So take me back. So you have your bachelor's degree in American and African-American history. So not marketing at all, not related to that at all. And then later on you went and then you ended up getting um, your master's again, not in marketing. So talk to me about this like early time in your life, what you were learning about yourself before you figured out that social media was where you wanted to go. Yeah. So, you know, I, I finished college having majored in history. I went to work on Capitol Hill for a couple of years, which was great. A lot of fun. And when I went to Capitol Hill, I thought I was going to leave and go to law school. And then sometime in those two years, I was like, I definitely don't want to go to law school. <laughs> um, and so from there, I decided to go and get a master's um, in international relations from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Um, and so I ended up with a master's in international conflict resolution, human security that obviously has nothing to do <laughs> um, really what I, with what I do now, except there's some places that works in um, where it really changed is I spent a summer in Freetown, Sierra Leone, working for the U.S. Embassy, um, just interning for the summer. And I really got interested in communications, public diplomacy, um, and all of that is just kind of the marketing and comm side of the government. And so when I finished school, I decided to kind of jump into interning in PR and I figured, you know, I want to go into comms. And then I quickly realized that PR was not for me. Um, and, you know, in the sense of everything happens for a reason, I met someone um, at the job I was interning at and said, you know, hey, I know someone working on a show and they need someone to do social for them. And this was back when social was only Facebook and Twitter. Um, and it was still pretty new. It was, you know, 2010 probably. And so it was the same year and probably right before Instagram came out. Um, and so I, you know, started doing social freelance and then from there ended up at agencies working on social and I just found I really loved it. It was kind of just crazy and fast paced and you didn't really know everything you were going to get because A, it was still, you know, new to really market heavy on there and, and B, it was you know, there's so many opinions and it was so unfiltered. There were so many um, ways in. And so it was definitely interesting, but I just found that that connection with people, the storytelling, um, all of that really resonated with me. And so I ended up in agencies for about nine years um, until I moved out to LA. And I kind of did something that, you know, I think people get worried about in their careers a lot. I 
went to an agency um, that was a little bit more like where I had started, a little bit more PR focused. And I found I really didn't like it. They had moved me out to LA. I, you know, was like, oh, this will be great. I'll, you know, work in their LA office. It was a great way to, to get here. And probably about four months in, I felt like I, I can't do this anymore. Um, and it really wasn't the right fit for where I was in my career, what I wanted to do. And so you know, at that moment, I was feeling what I think a lot of people fear when they leave a job um, sooner than they planned, or, you know, something doesn't work out the way they thought it would. I felt a lot of like, worry, I felt some embarrassment of, you know, I've told my friends, I got this great job. And now I don't like the job. I felt a lot of obligation to like stay um, for at least a year, right? Like I all of these things that you kind of hear throughout your career. And, you know, after some like real thinking and even talking with my mom, you know, it was one of those things where I was like, I don't have to do this. Like, I don't have to be unhappy for another eight months to prove, you know, that I'm good at what I do or that I'm dedicated to something. I think, you know, the best way to really think about it is like, how can I find other opportunities and make sure I, you know, keep this relationship and let them know, I just don't think it's the right fit for me, but I'm thankful for everything. And so that's how I ended up um, finding a job at Fox Entertainment, which is just all the TV shows, anything from, you know, Bob's Burgers to Mass Singer um, that was on at the time. And, I was able to use some connections that I had from past agency life to kind of reach out to the people that were hiring from that. And that's how I ended up in LA in the entertainment business. Okay. What a story. Oh my gosh. So I'm going to, I want to dive in a little bit more onto some of the points that you touched on, because I think it can be relevant to a lot of people. I think I'm going to rewind because you, you talked about a lot of stuff there. So I want to talk about that decision to leave your job in under a year. So I think a lot of us may have found ourselves in a position in a role that we did not like. And we always hear that stay at the job for at least one year, stay at the job for at least two years. Like you have to do that. It's going to look bad on your resume. They're not going to want to hire you. And you feel this immense pressure to stay. So can you talk about if that has, if you've been asked about that experience and like in other roles, how have you addressed that or how, you know, your perspective on making sure that you leaving did not you know, hurt your chances of getting any future jobs. Yeah. So I actually really haven't been asked about it. Um, oh, and wow. I think there's a few reasons why. Um, I think maybe once, but like in general, you know, my past history, right? Like you have to take your working history as a full story. And so my past history doesn't show, you know, jumping around outside of being freelance, like jumping around from company to company. I had a consistent, you know, four years at an agency, a consistent two years at other places. Um, and so I think that was part of it. I think also making sure that like, you know, a lot of people are so worried. You always see the memes about like, what's that gap on your resume mean, right? People are really not looking at the numbers that closely to be like, what were you doing in this time, right? Like this is a time where people have so many things going on. There's so many things in their lives that it's really hard to have people try to account for every month they were doing something. And I think at first when I started to apply for jobs and I was leaving that position, I felt like, oh, I have to have this on my resume. I have to say I was here for four months. And then you realize like you actually don't right like you don't have to um kind of like own up to like oh I was somewhere for a short amount of time every time you talk about your resume it's fine to discuss it it's fine you know when you're looking for their job so people can know where you're at at the moment and being honest about that is really important but as you move on with your career like a four month stint where you found out something wasn't a fit and then you found something afterwards that was you know it's not going to be as big of a deal, I think, as people worry about. So I think it's about being honest up front when you're looking for the job after that. So they know that like you're in a new situation and you are looking to change, but also in those interviews, being honest about why you're looking to change and what the difference is and where your strengths really lie and maybe why they're not resonating at the position you're in. Um, and knowing that's okay to, to talk about. Um, and, and I think in my interview process, when I was looking to go to Fox, I was open to talking about 
this is why it's such a short amount of time at this place. And here's why I'm looking for a change. And here's what I'm looking for. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I found in that moment, it didn't hinder me. And then I didn't feel the need, you know, four or five years later to keep tying myself to those four months. I think that's yeah. a thing that people get worried about. And I think, you know, if it's something about a decision you made on your own, it's always great to kind of free yourself from worrying about that so much. I hope that gives a lot of people listening peace of mind because I know I've talked to a lot of people that have struggled with that decision of feeling like I'm just going to stay for this amount of time. And I think it could also sometimes justify staying where it's comfortable, right? It's easier not to quit. It's harder to go back on the job hunt, go find another job, do the whole thing again because job hunting is really hard. So I think that sometimes I, it can be used as an excuse, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, what an incredible opportunity being able to move over to Fox and that would never have happened if you wouldn't have left the role where you were unhappy. So I I love that. And I, and I think it's good to kind of have that peace of mind that it, it doesn't have to hinder your opportunities for future roles. It reminds me of how in college, how everyone told you you had to hit a certain GPA, like you cared so much about your GPA and then you're in the job market and it literally does not matter. It does not matter. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I kind of also feel that way about cover letters. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm starting a whisper campaign about cover letters because it's a lot to read a cover letter on top of a bunch of resumes. Like most, most people are like trying to see a really well put together resume. Just if anyone's wondering. <laughs> That's also a good point. Um, let's, I, we'll take a little detour since you mentioned resumes. I think that's a question I get a lot about cover letters and resumes for people on the job hunt. So cover letters, you're saying, okay, maybe not the most valuable thing. The resume matters more. I'm curious, what are some of the things if you are hiring that you look for on a resume? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not a fan of cover letters, but I say, if you do write one, like make it fun, make it you make it feel a little bit quirky. Don't repeat the things that are in your resume. Um, make sure it's the things that are adding color and like excitement to who you are and really bringing that to life. So if you do, I it's, I know it's hard to break three, free from the cover letter life, but if you're able to, um, that is the best thing to do is make sure it feels unique that way. Um, in terms of a resume, I'm looking for things that are succinct. I want to see, you know, to the point of like, like the thing that you did and, you know, how it related to the company overall. I also want to see like, what are your skills? Where have you, you know, whether it's like you've spoken somewhere or, you know, other extracurricular things you've done, things like that, I think are super important. Working in social, even though it seems obvious, like even having the proficiency that you have across social platforms and, you know, everything from like the Microsoft Word Suite to social platforms, right? We use everything in marketing comms. Um, and so I think it's it's really helpful to kind of see you know, the things that you also are passionate about. I, I've seen resumes um, that really detail even things, and it doesn't always have to be this way. I was, sometimes I like to say to like tailor your resume to what you're applying for. So I think it's really thinking about that too. So if you've worked in marketing, you want to do more of the social focus marketing, like how can you hone in on the ways that you did social so that it feels like you you took some intention with what you were putting out there? Okay. I, I I think that customization part is super important when you're applying to jobs. I've even sometimes, even if you're applying to jobs within marketing and maybe you're applying to like social jobs versus general marketing coordinator jobs, you could even have two separate resumes where one is just like slightly more social focused and the other is slightly more generalist focused. Um, but I love that advice there. And then for, um, okay, so for cover letters, you're saying to, to, if you're going to do them, make them more fun and make them more personal. And then for resumes, try to tailor them. Okay. I love that. Maybe we'll circle back to that, but I always kind of like hearing everyone's perspective on resumes and cover letters yeah. because I think it always kind of changes depending on person to person. Absolutely. Okay. So the other quick thing I wanted to touch on before we move forward with Fox and then Prime and then Nat, uh, Nat Geo is when you started your career, you switched you know, your dream job changed a lot or where you wanted to go changed a lot. And I, I love the advice of like the best way to figure out what you want to do is to first figure out what you don't want to do. I, I still stand by that very much to this day, but I'm also curious because I think it's 
really, really bold to make such drastic career moves, especially when you've invested significant money and time and in an education to completely say, I'm going to do something entirely different. So can you walk me through your process or just kind of what's going on in your head when you are in roles and you're figuring out that they may not be for you and, and a different career path may be the right choice of how do you break out of the, I, you know, that previous idea that you had about what your career would look like and completely pivot to something else? Yeah, um, I'd love to. I think it can be hard when you're younger because, you know, a lot of times you think like, oh, I chose this. So I have to do this and I have to find the way to do it. I have to find the way in and around and to then climb this ladder to be the top person doing this like I've seen other people do. Right. And nobody really takes the time to think like, do I want that person's job? Right. And I think it's so important to think the person that you're looking to, you know, climb the ladder and get to that position. Do you want that job? Is that something that is for you? And I think a lot of times in my life, whether it's, you know, getting a master's that doesn't directly relate to my job um, or figuring, you know, I want to go to law school and then deciding not to all of those things were me a responding to who I was in the moment and how I was growing. Um, but also to kind of, of like the twists and turns that life brought me, right? And I think a big part of what I think about lately where I am in my career now is that I, I got good at kind of giving up on what I thought things were supposed to look like um, or how I was supposed to do them or where I was supposed to go or, you know, the timing that I assumed life would have. Um, I think it's, it's easy for people to judge based on their friends or other people or what they see other people getting at a certain age and in a certain time frame. And, you know, I had this conversation with my little sister not too long ago, but I worked a couple of years. I went to grad school. And then when I was 28 years old, I was an intern again and I was starting a new kind of career and I was willing to say, okay, I, I know that there's a lot I don't know. I'm willing to do the work, intern, freelance until I can get that full-time position. And a lot of people get worried about doing something like that when they're in their late eight twenties or, you know, not exactly sure. And they're like, well, I see my friends as this, you know, doing this job or they're all the way at this manager level. And it doesn't have to look the same for everyone. And it also doesn't mean that you won't get to that level at the same pace, right? You come in with different skills when you are older, you come in with a different focus, different goal sets, you know, all of these things. And so it's really about trusting yourself and the knowledge that you have and the experience that you have in both work and life. And then I think it's also about trusting the process, right? It's it's saying I can give up on like what I assumed it was and follow the opportunities that are coming to me, follow the things that I'm interested and passionate about. And I think, you know, I would have never, I mean, I always say this, but when I was in college and even when I was in most of grad school, this job didn't exist, right? A VP of social wasn't something that existed in the workplace at that time. And the social that I was doing when I started off was such early days of social media that for me, that was exciting. And it tapped into something that is interesting to me, which is, you know, trying something new, chartering a path that, you know, has a lot behind it because of the marketing and the comms and the history of that. But also there's there's a new part of it, the social part that real allowed me to tap into a lot other parts of me that weren't just so like writing and work focused. And I think looking at yourself holistically and as at life as a, you know, there's going to be roller coaster moments throughout all of it really helps you become willing to go where the opportunity is, tap into relationships and be open to, to pivoting when you need to. That is so beautiful. And uh, I, I hope for, again, giving some peace of mind to some, some girls that are finding themselves in situations where, you know, when you're in the middle of it, all of it just seems chaotic. And are you doing the right thing? And what is right for me? And I, I agree when you're young, it's so hard to figure out what that is. And the answer changes all the time of what you want and what is, what is right for you. I also want to note that Tulani started at Fox over 10 years after she graduated from her bachelor's degree. So, and that's when you found your group, right? Cause you went from like Fox to prime to Nat Geo, all in media and all in entertainment, but it took 
a significant amount of time to figure out that that's where you wanted to be. That was your thing. It didn't just happen right when you graduated. And I think a lot of new grads put a lot of pressure on themselves to immediately figure out exactly what they want to do and get, you know, the job at their dream company right away. But it doesn't always work out that way. And it's absolutely okay because your path will find you. Yeah. And what I will say too, is that this is absolutely what I love to do and and where I work now, but even entertainment and TV is not who I am. And I always like to tell people that because I, you know, loved working in the agency world. And what that allowed me was to get to know a lot of different kinds of clients and a lot of different ways of working in social. And though I'm in TV right now, the position that I have, you know, combines TV and editorial and all these things that I've done in other agency jobs. And that really set me up for this kind of hybrid role that I have now. Um, will my next job be in TV? I have no idea, right? I'm, I'm open to it being something that taps into, you know, my master's and is more international. I'm open to it, you know, being at like a complete completely different kind of company. I think the most important thing you can do for yourself is find the thing that you're really good at and that you're really passionate about and hone in on it so that you can do that anywhere. And at this point in my career, I know I can do social, social marketing, comm, storytelling, anywhere I'm placed for whatever company it may be. Um, and it's really so important to like find out like what is that thing that you know you can be placed there and do it to the best of your ability better than other people around you um and and really be proud about that and so I feel like that's definitely one of the most important things you can do for yourself I love that and I also love that you mentioned that just because you have experience in one industry doesn't mean that you have to be there forever it doesn't mean that you can't enter another I think that's also a really common thing I hear a lot is a lot of the younger girls I talk to want to work in beauty or fashion or entertainment right away and sometimes those jobs are more competitive but also like you said you don't have to start there to be able to get a job there. Your skills can be transferable, irregardless of what the industry is. I also hear a lot that agency experience will help diversify that and make you even, you know, um, a better fit for other roles. So you don't have to stay in your lane. Um, career growth doesn't have to be linear, right? You can jump over. You could go to all different industries and you don't have to feel like just because where you're starting your career, you have to be there forever. Those skills will will switch over to another industry. Absolutely. And I do think that people are more and more looking for people that have a wide range of experience, especially when you're looking at social and, and the way that people talk and work and do things on social. They're looking for people that can adapt. Um, I'm always looking for that. So when I look at resumes or when I consider, you know, who would join our team, it's not people that have only worked in a certain industry. Um, it's really looking at the whole, you know, the whole picture of it. So industry experience is great, but also like, have you done social somewhere that they do social really well, or there's something really interesting or creative? Um, and so I do like to pay attention to that too because, you know, that's a big part of diversity in hiring as well, is looking at people that don't all come from the same kind of job or have the same kind of interest areas that have to directly align um, with where they're applying to. And so I think that's that's definitely important to know that. Yeah, you what you think makes you unqualified for a role can actually be a thing that helps you stand out and actually be chosen for that role. Um, okay, I'm going to dig into your role a little bit at National Geographic, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A to the audience. So if you have questions, get them ready. I'll open it up, open it up in just a couple minutes. So your role at National Geographic. So um, can you talk to me? I know you've, you're you just starting out. It's um, You started out back in September. So can you tell me what it's been like taking over social for such a legacy brand and a little bit about what your role entails? Yeah. So, so far it's been amazing. Um, the people at Nat Geo, obviously Nat Geo has been around 136 years. Uh, it has an amazing legacy. It also has just amazing people that work there that are really passionate and so smart. I think the most exciting part about this role is that it's combining two teams together. So now we have a social team that worked on the media side. So worked with digital content, magazine, editorial, and then you have the TV social team that worked on all these entertainment um, projects and shows and all, doc films, all of that for Nat Geo are now one social team under me. Um, oh, wow. So it's a new position. Um, it's a new configuration of the team. And it's 
very exciting to one, be a place where you can bring together these audiences and the people working on them and really think strategically of how we take something that's so historic and make sure that we're continuing to keep up with where social is, where it's going, and bringing more people into the fold at a younger age of what Nat Geo is and all of the exciting things that we do have to offer that you can watch, explorations you can go on, um, things that you can learn, all of those things. It's, it's super exciting to work with the team um, that's doing all of that. And I inherited... 13 or so really awesome people. So um, it's been really amazing to work with them and see where their strengths are and really help them hone in on that. And so, yes, it's been, it's been great, but it's definitely been a lot. Yes. Especially in new positions, I think are always even extra hard because on top of doing your work, you also have to like figure out what your role even looks like. So that adds an extra level to it, but also I think very exciting when you kind of get to mold that and you know you get to be the one that that kind of creates this new role and and what that looks like yeah. I am curious because Nat Geo is just across you know there's multiple different accounts that you guys manage across multiple different platforms so when you're thinking because you know you're not the one day-to-day -day creating all the content but you're more high level what are some of the ways that you think about social strategy and creating a really strong one, especially within today where we are in the era of abundance, when we are just constantly surrounded by content all of the time? How do you think about social strategy? Yes, there's so much content. There's so many things to consume. You don't know where to focus your eyes. Um, I think that the the best way to think about strategy with what at any company you're at, one is any strategy you create is a living document. And by that, I mean, it doesn't mean you write it and then you forget it forever, right? Or write it and just stay to it forever. You really want to know that it's something that you're going to revisit when you get feedback, when you get stats back, when your audience grows or changes. It's something that's going to always really be living in the background as a you know guide to what you're doing. And so when I look at strategies, first, you always want to look at, you know, what are your goals of even creating the strategy, being on social? And then even more importantly, you want to look at your audience. Who is your target audience? Who are you actually trying to hit? Where do they live on social? Where do they live in the world? You know, what do you know about them? So that you're really able to understand, okay, here's why I'm doing it, but it's also who I'm doing it for and get to know that audience and really understand what makes them tick, what's engaging to them. You know, they might be on Instagram, but are they also, you know, using a certain app all the time? Are they also, you know, shopping at a certain place? Like what is the 360 of people? And I think that you know, that's the most important part of any kind of marketing is really, you know, making personas and looking at, you know, who's the whole person that you're trying to market to, what things to even, you know, a lot of times I like to do the exercise of like, you know, naming the person and saying like, this is what they like to do in their free time. This is where they shop. This is whatever. And it helps really bring to life, you know, who you're trying to reach with your content when you're in a space of like oversaturation of content all the time. Um, from there, I think it's really about looking at, you know, based on those goals, how do you meet them with a social first mentality? So a lot of times you're in bigger companies and there's a lot of competing priorities. Every social team, or if you work in social, you know, you know, there's a lot of teams asking you for different things or how can we get this up or we want to make this more social and making sure that you are taking all of that in and saying, okay, this is how we make this fit for social, or this is, you know, the tweak we can make to this trailer or to this post or this copy or this article that's really going to help it resonate in the social space. We obviously don't have a crystal ball and social is so random. Anything can, you know, blow up and anything could be amazing and then just, you know, not get as many eyes as it deserves. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think it's, you know, I'm right now I'm doing some judging for like the shorty awards and I'm realizing like I'm seeing some amazing campaigns that I just hadn't seen out in social. So it doesn't mean they're not great. It just means, you know, you never know what exactly what's going to hit. Um, and so I think that you really want to think about 
the goals, the audience, and then what exactly are you trying to message and what is the action that you want them to take? Um, a lot of times we kind of think of just like social for social sake and we don't tie that back to the goals or what you're hoping the audience does or what you're hoping to change about, you know, their relationship to your brand. And yeah, so I think those are super important. Obviously going into analytics, what success looks like to you, um, how often you are actually tracking. That's one of the best parts of social is that you can see immediately if people did resonate with what you were saying, or if it did reach the right audience, all of those things are possible. And so I think that looking into, you know, the actual bulk of your strategy, what kind of content's going out, how it drives back to the goals, but also making sure to focus on analytics, your timeline, how you're really rolling out these changes and suggestions that you're, that you're putting forth in a strategy. Um, amazing. Incredible. I hope everyone is taking notes. I know I was. Um, I have a lot of questions that I want to dig into more about what you just shared, but I also, we don't have a ton of time left and I want to make sure the audience has enough time to ask questions. So I'm going to open it up to Q and A. If you want to turn your cameras on, you're welcome to come on and ask any questions you have um, to Tulani, or you can put them in the chat and I can ask them. Um, so we'll do an open Q and A now, if you guys want to jump in. All right, Ashley, if you want to ask your question. Uh, Ashley, we can't, uh, or your audio is a little bit, it's coming in and out. We can't hear you. Do you want to put your question in the chat and then I'll, if you want to just type it in the chat and then I'll read it out to Tulani. I'm oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, now we can hear you. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm currently a social media manager and I was just kind of wondering, like I'm in the market for like a new job and I've been like putting in applications and haven't been hearing back or I've been getting like denied. Um, I was just wondering if you had any tips that you could provide or any skills that you could recommend that I should hone to kind of make my resume stand out. Absolutely. Um, I will acknowledge that right now it probably it's it's a tough job market. I think that everyone knows that. And I feel like with everything from, you know, layoffs that have happened across all industries and all the changes that are going on, um, you know, post all of the 2020 slowdown, I think, you know, if you are applying right now, the first thing I'll say is to not be discouraged um, and not think, you know, I think we have a tendency to look inward um, all of the time. And we don't always take a look at like society and the world around us and what's going on and why maybe that plays into um, that plays into what's happening or why you might not be hearing back. I think that, you know, when you're looking at your resume and how to make it, you know, stand out. I think that the succinctness of what you're saying of experience wise, I'd like to look at a resume, in my opinion, that says like, here's actually what I did. And if there's results, I love a results of like, we saw, you know, growth in this area, or we saw this many more followers, or we saw, you know, this kind of engagement. Um, even if it's like about sentiment, like, I think it, it's even helpful to kind of know and understand some of that. And I think that stands out because not everyone does it. And this is more so of standing out, right? It's not a, a have to, but I do think that stands out because not everyone does that. I do think highlighting, you know, if you've spoken somewhere, or if you have any other outside things that you've done that are around your job is always a good thing. Sometimes people are like, I don't know where to include it, but I think it's helpful even if you have like a side margin to include it there. Um, I think also making sure, and I know most people do this at this point, but making sure that um, it is one page, unless, you know, there's some reason. And even I have, you know, as, as, um, Natalie mentioned, like I have a lot of experience, but I keep my resume to one page. I keep everything in one place and make sure that it's something that when you pick it up, you can get a picture of me right away. And so I think those three things, like making it succinct, adding those, you know, takeaway stats, if you do have them, and then making sure you're adding special skills, but it's all staying on, on one page is super important. Thank you. All right, I'll read a question from the chat and then I'll open it back up if anyone wants to speak. So we have one from Ariel. 
Um, hi, Chilani. Can you share how you identified your strengths within your career and how you leverage them to achieve success? Are there any specific strategies or insights you found effective? Um, yes. So I always say, especially for social, but it happens in every industry, you know, when you're, I was starting out with social, I think there's a few ways you can go, right? You can go full kind of like content. Um, and when I was starting out, there really wasn't a just like a social focus design, um, but like content, content creation, design. You can go the analytics route, right? You can go like you're focusing on the numbers, stats, and doing social analytics. You can go the paid media route, right? Um, and I, I know all of this because when I started my career, I did all three of those because that wasn't a thing that you broke down. Um, and then, you know, the the other part of it is just like overall strategy and creating strategy and marketing strategies for social. And so I always say there's about three or four of those. Some of them you could combine. And I realized, you know, having done... <laughs> the analytics of it and like never being any kind of math major um, and not pretending to be one or playing one on TV. Um, and I did the paid side, which I enjoyed, but I thought, you know, it focused a lot more on, uh, you know, a little bit less on like exactly what content and more on like where the dollars go and how that works, which was great, but I didn't think it was exactly where I wanted to move my career. And so I saw the like content creation and strategy part of it as something that really resonated with what I was interested in. And, um, and I think that then I started to just hone in on that. So at some point, it doesn't always happen, you know, when you expect it, but in a career, you're going to see there's more people taking more stuff as things get bigger, right? So as paid got bigger, there was more specific people working on paid for social. And that could have been a route that I took, right? You're going to see more of like paid social jobs, that kind of thing. Um, and then I saw things that were a little bit more organic focused and uh, content and strategy focused. And I really felt like that was the right fit for me. I think that happens in any industry of like there's gonna be some ways that things start to break down so one it's about you know what's most enjoyable for you it doesn't you know it doesn't have to be the you know, one that feels flashier it can you know it might not be the one leading the whole strategy but it might be the people in the are you know working on the analytics and saying like this actually did work or here's what you should change you still need knowledge of social you need, still need passion for marketing and comms um but it's okay to take that different route so i think being honest with what feels exciting to you what feels like you are consistently learning and challenging um you know, assumptions about how things are supposed to go. The other big thing about social is that it changes every day. And so in each of those paths, you really can always learn something new and there's always something changing. I hope that answered. Thank you, Tulani. Okay, Lauren, if you wanna go next and ask your question. Hi, Um. so I am post-grad and I just graduated in December. So I'm trying to learn- Congratulations. Thank you. I'm trying to learn as much as I can for my career, but also trying to like not get into the post-grad blues. So how do you prioritize or find balance in your personal development and your professional development? Yeah. So first is like you take a deep breath and you know it's it's going to work out. There's so many of us that have been in that place, in that space of, you know, what do I do afterwards? You come from this college bubble, um, which like, in my opinion, is like just some of the best times in life. And then you're like, oh my God, <laughs> like they're going to make me make choices. <laughs> so that can be a lot. I think it's about a big part of it, even when you're looking for a job, but especially post-grad, it's about, you know, you finish college, it's about like figuring out like, okay, who am I now? I don't have school to lean back on. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not just a kid to my parents anymore. I don't have to rush off to a class. All of these things, I don't have the extracurriculars in the same way that I used to. Um, and so it's really a great time of self-reflection. I think there's a few things that I find helpful. I think one, it's looking at yourself holistically. Like I, I always say I'm a big hobbyist. Like I will pick up a new project like 
in a second of, I just wanted to learn it, right? I've been knitting since I was 18, fun fact, random, but like, I can always pick up something and knit if I need a minute to just take a break, or I love to travel, I love to read, like, you know, crappy romance novels, or, you know, last year I took guitar lessons, right? Like, there's so many facets to me because I decided at some point, like, I'm going to try new things to make sure that I feel like a you know, I've done all the things that I want to do. And what you find when you pick up hobbies, um, and this is really about the personal part of it, is like you find out how you learn. You find out about something different that you haven't maybe, you know, done before and and like how that fits into like other things that you're interested in. Um, and you also fill your time with something else that's not worrying about getting a job, right? Or applying to jobs. And I think that's really important because that is what kind of A, brings in a more like calm approach to, okay, I'm going to get this sorted out, but I also don't have to put my whole life on hold to find work, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't always feel that way. You're like, I think a lot of people think like, okay, when I have a job, everything will be set. And that's just not how it is, right? A job is just a job. It's not your life. It's not who you are. It's not what makes you, you know, good, bad, you know, the best of whatever you are, what makes that and the things that you're interested in passionate about is what makes that. And so looking at yourself holistically in that way and getting those hobbies is great. And I think the other part is like really sitting down and saying, okay, in the morning I have this routine, like I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to have, you know, coffee or some hot water with lemon. I'm going to meditate, you know, for 20, 30 minutes. And then I'm going to spend, you know, two, three hours doing job search, working on a resume, you know, whatever that might be. It might be a, you know, coffee date with someone that works in the industry you want to work in and really looking at your day holistically and not so much of like, oh, here I go. Another day of sending a hundred resumes and not hearing what I want. Um, and it just, it, you have to come from a mind place of abundance. Like what you have right now is a degree, you have time, you have the passion and the interest. And it's less of like what you don't have and more of like, what am I coming into this with? How do I then structure my day? How do I give myself grace and time? And then how do I still get after it and get hungry and do the the work to get that position? And then how at the end of the day, do I then let that go, right? Because a lot of times worrying about it or stressing can affect our sleep, our well-being, all of those things. And that then takes you out of this mindset of like, I do have this and this is what I'm going to work with. I think the other thing too is not being afraid to freelance, not being afraid to do temp work, not being afraid to like put your resume for something that, you know, may not be exactly what you thought you would do next. Because a lot of times those opportunities are just having like a little something on the side or something that you're working on or a project that you're doing for someone um, can really help change your mindset because you're in a different kind of phase than just looking you're actually doing um and so i always say like consider those even part-time things those short-term things that can help you get towards your goal thank you of course i love that thank you okay um lindsay if you want to ask your question thanks natalie hi Tulani. um hi. i heard you mention that you worked for agencies for nine years and i've also seen other successful marketers that have that same background. So curious what key takeaways you took from your time with the agencies and if you would recommend that to marketers that are still early in their career. Yeah, I absolutely re recommend working at agencies. And I know it's it's there's a there's a lot of opinions on this. I think the reason I recommend it is because you're going to get so many different experiences and especially in social um, it's definitely, it's about different kinds of clients, right? Like different industries, you know, I, you know, had clients that were, you know, from the NFL and I had clients that were for the embassy of Egypt, right? Like there's, it's a, it's going to be a wide range of things, but I think there's a few reasons. One, it's finding out what kind of, you know, different industries Two, it's about problem solving, and 
the problem is going to be different for every single client. Like everyone that comes to you is not looking for the same exact thing you did from the last client. And some of them, there'll be overlap. Some of those things you can pull in of like, oh, we have this one-on-one or we have this plan or whatever. But a lot of it is about pushing yourself to creatively think like, how do I solve this problem? How do I get to a solution? And that starts to change you as a marketer because you're not just looking at like, oh, this is what we did last year. This is what else we're doing. It's so much more than that. It's really about, you know, what is their problem? How do we think about it? How do we think about it differently? And then how do we solve it? The other part of that that I found really helpful too is that you're going to get varying budget levels, right? And so that means that like not everyone's going to come in with a huge budget and you're like, oh, we can just do this and run these ads and do this, whatever. That can't be your solution every time. Some people are going to come in with smaller budgets and need the same kind of attention and help that you know, anyone else would get. And so I always say, like, I love that I worked at, you know, one of the agencies I worked at worked with like a lot of government agencies, nonprofits, NGOs. And so you learn that like, these, you know, smaller groups, what are the other things I can do to work within their budget and still deliver that same high level of social strategy of marketing um, advice that I would for someone else that works within the, the confines that they might have at that moment. And so those, those things are really like, you can't get that in the same way. Um, if you start in-house and you stay in-house all the time. And I also do think that makes you like a even better candidate for in-house positions because having that diversity of backgrounds and being able to speak to a lot of different situations like that is, is super helpful. Thank you. Makes total sense. Okay. Thank you to Lonnie. Um, we are just about on time here. I know I, I have a lot of, there's a lot more questions, but I hope that hopefully we got a lot answered. Um, do you have time for one more to Lonnie or do you have a hard stop? I can take, I can take one or two more if, okay. if you like. I have no problem with that. I think okay, I let me do one from the chat and then if we want to rapid fire one from the chat and then we'll do one. Uh, yes, Belle, you'll be our last one. Um, okay, how do you recommend organizing freelance work on a resume? I freelance for multiple companies but struggle to include it all on my resume without being very lengthy. That's from Audrey. Um. So it depends on how you want to do it. I... I think it's, how did I do my freelance? So when I had most of my freelance stuff, I just had it under kind of a freelance bucket. And then I had just a shorter section in each one of those. And I think I know sometimes it can feel like, oh, she has so many different jobs and you want to like make that clear. Um, so I think one, it could be like the title is freelance social media, whatever, freelance, whatever. And then you have like a top line of like the things you do and then the companies that you do them for. It helps to just organize it a little and people have a better idea. If you're doing something that's completely different from everyone for each person or each group that you're freelancing for, I think having a top line of something that's consistent and then, you know, maybe a one to two bullet breakout of what that looks like so that people can see it does vary. You're doing a few different things, but there's also like overall, this is kind of your freelance approach. And then also like make your font small. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Belle, you'll be our last question for uh, today's episode. Thank you, Natalie. Um, hi, Tulani. Thank you for coming today. Um, I would love to know when looking at resumes and LinkedIn or just like the profiles online, what is something that quickly catches your eye or makes you think like this candidate is so much more different than the others? What catches my eye? I like to look at on LinkedIn Yes, resume, all that is great and, and what you've done. I also like to look at what people are sharing, um, what they're talking about, the things that they have opinions on, um, maybe some kind of you know conference that they've been a part of, what they've learned from that, wins that they're sharing from, you know, work that they've done. I think it's interesting because, you know, we know what LinkedIn 
is is good for. And then we also have this chance on LinkedIn to show people more about ourselves by writing on LinkedIn or sharing articles about our industry that we think are interesting and then writing about why we think they're interesting. Um, we have a chance to talk about wins. We have a chance to talk about ourselves or things that we've attended. And so a lot of times on LinkedIn, I like to see what people are sharing. What are they talking about? What are they, you know how are they adding their voice to the industry conversation? And what does that, again, holistic person look like? Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and I, I think that, you know, helps me get a good idea of exactly, you know, what the person's interested in, how much time they're spending on building up that persona in a place that they're looking for a job. Um, and yeah, and I will say quickly, I know that was our last question, but I know Jess had a question in the comments um, about what's a skill aside from adaptability that's refreshing to see amongst team members or previous team members that I oversee. And I will say that kind of plays into that. I love to see people that are, you know, creative. I love to see people that have outside passions. I love people that are like humble and hungry, if you will. So, you know, that are really interested in learning and knowing that something that I know and take to heart is that you can't like, you can't know everything about social all the time. It changes every single day, but are you willing to figure out what those changes are to engage in conversation, to make sure you're staying on top of what's new on the platform, all of that stuff. Um, I think it's just super important to, again, kind of like I was saying to Lauren, like, look at yourself as a whole person. Where are the things that, you know, you're really passionate about how are you honing in on those things? And then how are you representing yourself, you know, in a place like LinkedIn where you're looking for work? Um, and then in the office, when you are working with people, how do you both show that you're excited and you have a lot of knowledge, but also you're like, you know, humble and excited to learn more things. Um, and that's something that I really try and bring and that I, the characteristic that I always look for in people. Okay. Thank you so much to Lonnie and thank you so much for staying on a little bit later to answer a couple extra questions. This has been so much fun. I hope a lot of you all learned a lot from Tulani today. Um, if you guys haven't heard of Sky Society before, if this is your first time, this is just a version of what we do for our podcast episodes. Normally we don't have a live Q&A, but this is the first day of our Lucky Girl series. So I hope you'll come back tomorrow and on Friday. Tomorrow we're interviewing, um, I, I think, the brand, man the brand marketing manager at Solid Core, and then Friday, um, copyright their manager at Clinique. So definitely come back for those two episodes. Our 50th episode is, or sorry, our 100th episode is actually going to be released next week. Um, so right now we're also doing a giveaway right now. So if you liked coming and listening to Tilani, um, if you want to come to another live Sky Society podcast episode that's not open to the public, if you leave a review for the podcast and you just screenshot that and DM us on Instagram the screenshot, you'll be entered to win to go to another live um, recording that's just me, the guest, and you. So if you like this and want more, definitely enter that. But I, we still have the rest of our Lucky Girl series tomorrow and Friday. So make sure you come back for more. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, my name is Natalie. Uh, I'm the host of the Sky Society podcast. And this episode or this whole event series was put on by the woman in our accelerator class, Sky Society Accelerator. Um, we have Lauren here today. She's in one of the classes that hosted it. Um, Alex, who's on our screen too, she's graduated. So thank you girls for putting this on. I very much appreciate you. And I think that's all for today. Thank you so much, Tulani. Awesome. Thank you. It was so nice to meet all of you. I'm always around for questions. Um, but yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And then last thing, this will be published the Sky Society podcast probably in about two weeks. So if you do want to re-listen, it will be published on the podcast and on YouTube as well. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, Tulani. And I hope to see the rest of you girls back tomorrow for our next Lucky Girl series uh, live recording. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.